So our next presenter is going to be Alan Chain. He's the live dog import supervisor for USDA. And he is going to be talking about live dog import today. Please welcome Alan. Thank you. So hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome again to Animal Care's live dog, or sorry, welcome to Animal Care's transportation symposium. Um, I'm Alan Cheng with APHIS Animal Care. I'm currently a supervisory program specialist uh, with our live dog import team. We are one of the three uh, agencies or, or branches that have uh, regulatory oversight on the federal level over the importation of live dogs. So for animal care, we handle the commercial aspect of it. So basically uh, the permitting uh, portion of it. We also have USDA veterinary services. Um, they're gonna cover the uh, areas of agricultural concern so mainly uh, African swine fever and also screwworm. We also have the slight typo there, but Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, uh, they cover um, diseases with human health concerns. So when it comes to the importation of live dog, we're mainly talking about uh, the rabies status um, of the country that the dog is coming from. So in addition to that, uh, there's also gonna be customs requirements. So uh, US uh, Customs and Border Protection, CBP, are gonna have general requirements as well. Um, they don't technically have oversight, but they are a big partner for all the agencies listed up there in our uh, mission for animal welfare. Um, not really, doesn't really fall into the oversight, but uh, there are also sometimes maybe individual state requirements. Um, if that's the case, uh, that's going to happen post entry, meaning uh, after the federal importation process. Where we can assist, we will try. Um, if it Sometimes it gets a little complicated as um, we'll kind of see as this talk goes on. Um, before we actually dive into it, let's get into a little bit more background about what is actually animal care live dog import. Um, so we actually already heard a little bit or actually a lot about the Animal Welfare Act or the AWA earlier. I just wanted to add a little bit more context uh, as it relates to dog imports. So in 2008, Congress added specific language to the AWA, which regulates dogs imported into the United States for the purpose of resale or adoption. Um, that's going to come up a lot. I'm going to kind of keep repeating it because it, there's going to be not siloed areas of responsibility, but it's going to be like kind of a Venn diagram where we all overlap, um, where we kind of jump into the process is from that commercial aspect. Um, the AWA also has um, other requirements in there talking about transportation, uh, the restrictions of importation, again, for resale, uh, prohibitions on dog fighting and then, uh, well, animal fighting, and then uh, to prevent the, uh, the theft of personal pets. Some more background for everybody. Um, so uh, we already had Bob and Chad talk uh, from AC, but uh, LDI is in a live dog import, is in a unique position because we are allowed to collaborate so freely within animal care. I just wanted to go over some of these work units um, really briefly so that when I talk about the groups, everybody has a general idea of who we're talking about. So I'm going to start on the left side of the chart with our field operations. Uh, so we have AWO, Animal Welfare Operations. Those are our VMOs and animal care inspectors in the field who do inspections uh, at our licensed facilities. Um, they meet our shipments on site when necessary. They write our inspection reports, do our uh, non-compliance uh, citations. I probably just repeated that. Uh, we also have program support uh, in field operations as well. So they take care of our licensing and registration. They also do our records management and our FOIA team is there as well. Moving over to the collaboratory, we have our compliance assurance staff. So they handle enforcement for animal care. Um, they have our national enforcement coordinators and our compliance specialists. So anytime our inspectors in the field uh, cite non-compliances or we get referrals from our public uh, partners or our government partners, we do the research and start to look into it. We wanna build up strong cases that our compliance assurance staff can pursue. Um, and that's gonna be um, a big part of kind of what we're talking about today and uh, how we're going to approve policy going forward. So that's kind of a nice segue into our national policy staff. Uh, Don, uh, Dr. Fitzhugh is, um, on that team, um, pretty self-explanatory what they do. Uh, we also have the Center for Animal Welfare. So they do outreach and training. Um, in addition to this event that they threw on, which is great, um, they house our specialists. So they have our species specialists. Um, Dr. Cody Yeager is our avian specialist, as well as our transportation specialists and our kennel specialists. So my team reaches out to Chad quite a bit um, for transportation uh, guidance, um, and they're a great help to all of us. 
and then my team with uh, permitting and live dog import. So as we get deeper into it, I'm going to mention um, some of these uh, groups, you know, in different aspects of how we collaborate. So just to give everybody a general idea. Okay, let's get into Animal Care's live dog import team and uh, focus back on us specifically as we get going. So LDI reviews applications from importers uh, who would like to import dogs, again, for the purpose of reseller adoption into the United States. If the applicant meets the specified USDA criteria, Animal Care Live Dog Import will issue the applicant or an importer a USDA import permit. Uh, throughout this process, we assist stakeholders and the public uh, with lawful importation. So if we get reports of possible non-compliances or we just see that an importer is not informed enough or is trying to take part in something that be, may be non-compliant, we play a big part in outreach of basically giving them the resources available to import uh, lawfully and within compliance. So a big first step to uh, even before start talking about like enforcement actions is we're proactive to reach out to the public and let them know what they need, which uh, agency you wanna reach out to depending on where you're importing from and what is the purpose of your importation. So my team does a great job in the review and enforcement process of uh, these applications. And a big part of that, again, and this is also a theme that's gonna come up is collaboration. So either within animal care with some of those units that I mentioned or outside with our partner government agencies on the federal, state and local level. So um, I already mentioned this earlier, but although our, I've mentioned this probably four times now, although our unit is focused on commercial imports, we still strive to support any cause that's going to increase animal welfare when it comes to dogs. So a big help to my team is being able to build those relationships with our stakeholders and just public, uh, the public in general who have, a, have an interest in animal welfare. Um, we get reports pretty regularly um, about personal pets, transportation issues, things that really kind of fall outside the scope of what LDI is responsible for. But a big part of the enforcement process is just to get it rolling, to know that we can reach out to points of contact and have collaboration with our stakeholders to maybe roll it back in. So it could start off as a personal pet transport, but once we do the research, the outreach, maybe look into if they have compliance cases going, we may find out that this person is suspected of working for a rescue group or trying to start up a rescue group. So some of these things, we do take all of the feedback that we get from the public and all those uh, suspected non-compliances, we look into them to see if there's a nexus to true uh, non-compliances that need enforcement action. So we are lucky that um, even though animal care is not a law enforcement agency, we work closely with CBP um, at certain ports of entry and they have more access to some of this information where we can get things going. CDC is also a huge help to us, um, as well as veterinary services. The constant goal throughout this process is uh, this evolving process is to basically gather enough information so that we can improve upon the process next time. Uh, we, it, it, since it is an evolving process, we wanna just sometimes even build quantitative data that we can provide hopefully to the national policy staff to improve the regs as we move along. I think a common theme um, from the first couple talks that have been happening is a lot of these regs and policies have, in have been in place for quite a while, right? So we're working in a landscape where as that chart shoots up and the registrations pop up, the live dog imports are going ex exponentially up. It comes with the territory that with all those compliant imports, you're gonna get more non-compliant imports, right? And we need to be prepared in the future to kind of address that because we're seeing some of that now and we're dealing with the cases case by case but we're definitely striving for a more uniform response, I guess, in the future. So bear with me on the next two or three slides. It's, it's a lot of text. Um, you don't have to read it all right here, but this is pulled directly from uh, Animal Care's Live Dog Import website. And we also have printed materials in that back uh, table over there that actually has this information. This is what the Live Dog Import team uh, works off of when they review an application from an importer to see if they meet the qualifications to import dogs commercially for the purpose of reseller adoption. So I'm not gonna read them all off to you guys, but I did want to go over the main points because th these would be the baseline points. If you can't hit that, you, uh, the application process is gonna be quite long for the importer. So the dog or dog should be at least six months of age at the time of entry into the US. 
They should be examined by a licensed veterinarian in the country of export, found to be in good health, uh, free of infectious disease, internal parasites, and external parasites, vaccinated for rabies by a licensed veterinarian at least 30 days before the date of entry. All that vaccination must um, happen after, yes, at least 84 days of age at the time of vaccination. And those vaccinations obviously must be current upon time of arrival. In addition to the rabies vaccine, oh, sorry. In addition to the rabies vaccinations, the dog or dogs must also be vaccinated and up to date within 12 months of entry into the US for the DHLPP series of vaccines. So that's distemper, hepatitis, parvo, parainfluenza, and lepto. And the health certificate that accompanies the shipment has to be issued in English. So this, I'll be honest with you all, is, a, is something that is a big lift and a challenge for us to do thoroughly, right? Because the whole idea of international imports is, depending on the country, sometimes it's translated, sometimes we have to request to get it in English. And you're gonna see later on in these points that we, we, we request the AV, the attending veterinarian's license number. This is tricky to verify sometimes. So because we don't always have access to law enforcement information, and that wouldn't honestly be law enforcement information unless the attending veterinarian has a pending uh, situation, I guess we'll call it. Um, sometimes it's a challenge, you know, verifying that information. And that's why we'll work with our partners to try to verify some of this information post entry. Um, on our website and during the application process, the applicant will have access to form 7041. That's basically the template that the importer or applicant is going to use to apply for one of these permits. Um, the health certificates and supplemental documents will support all of that. So on your right side, it's going to have what the certificate must include. So all the identifying information about the dog has to be on there. Not all dogs are microchipped or have a tattoo, depending on the country that they're coming from. So that's not required, but if it is uh, available, it is uh, one of the data points that we record internally in our system for, back, for, for not just backtracking, but the next time, I guess, right? Like if, if the importer reapplies again, we wanna make sure they're not importing the same dog or that paperwork is consistent. So the more data fields that are provided, we do track it um, and we ask for it actually. So one of the default questions we ask is, does this dog have any identifying marks or microchip, right? They can say no because it's not technically required, but we always ask to try to get that information. Um, the next point is gonna be the vaccination information, which is very important. So commercial names are different sometimes depending on the country than what we're used to. So this is a database that we keep as well, but we need that name, uh, that manufacturer lot number expiration date to make sure that that health certificate, even though the AV says it's legitimate, we wanna verify that ourselves on our end. And then as I mentioned, the veterinarian's um, license number. If they're licensed in the EU, it's much easier for us to verify uh, certain countries in Asia for sure, but the more, remote the country or more unusual for us to deal with on a federal uh, standpoint, it's gonna be um, kind of learn as we go, depending on the country it's coming from. Okay, so up to this point, we've talked about the framework for applying for a permit. Um, so if the applicant or importer does or does not meet the criteria during the application process, there are follow-up determinations for each scenario. So if it meets all the criteria mentioned on the last slide um, for a dog or dogs uh, attempting to enter the country for resale or adoption, we approve the permit and it's issued. That permit is good for 30 days on the date uh, of issuance. So if it does not meet the criteria and the required fields cannot be satisfied or corrected, we will deny. So I will say with that though, is that we do allow the customer to correct, right? We don't deny it. We just put it in a status where it goes back to the customer. So depending on if it's an easy fix or a harder fix, it will change the re-review the re process. So if it's something as simple as the importer picked the wrong port of entry, they picked the wrong airport, right? Um, they can go in there, they'll change it. We will verify that that's one of the ports the animal can fly into depending on let's say their, their rabies status, right? Like the origin of the country, is it a high risk rabies country? If they chose the wrong port, they can change that on the application, but do they have the supplemental information to back that up? So is the flight information correct? Is the, are the transportation requirements correct? Because if you say you're flying into Atlanta, and no, let's say you have to fly into Atlanta, but you chose, 
what's not a CDC one off the top of my head, Salt Lake City. You can change it on the form, but does your flight information match up? Does your airway bill match up to prove all of that, right? So that's actually a more simple re-review process for us. If it's something like the vaccination is going to expire in 20 days, but you're flying in 30 days, that's gonna be trickier for the applicant. So you have to go back to your attending veterinarian, get the dog re-examined and issued a new health certificate. That's something that the scrutiny of that process will be much longer and much more thorough. Um, I'll be honest with you all that people, importers have tried to attempt to alter health certificates themselves. This is a big part of our enforcement process, right? So we gather those documents, we save them. We try to build strong cases for our compliance assurance staff because those are compounding issues um, that go a long way in trying to identify some of these bad actors and these rescue groups who want to pose as, you know, that they're doing the right thing all the time when it's really just an expedited process to kind of facilitate their commercial ventures. Um, the importer or customer on their side can also, sorry, next slide. Oh, actually, one more point about this. Um, the importer or customer can also withdraw their application because they no longer are importing a dog or they need to re reapply for a new permit. So this can come up if flight arrangements change or the vaccination status, again, is about to expire. So if, if they did not import the dog within the 30 day time period, they can revoke. They basically, it's in the best interest of the importer that you don't leave a live permit in there that you didn't actually use, right? Because that can create inconsistencies the next time around. It, it may appear that you're trying to do something that's circumventing rules even when you're not. So some of our uh, regular importers, they know, right? If they miss the flight due to temperature, weather, logistics, they'll revoke on their end. And just to say, we don't need this one, let's clear it out of your system we can also revoke as well. Um, it's different than a denial. When we revoke, we basically do an audit of our system and see which permits have been used. So we verify that with our partners at CBP, even CDC sometimes to say, this dog, it's kind of a high risk shipment. They said they're coming in on the first and by the 10th, it never came in. So at that point, we kind of flag it and keep an eye on it, that the, that the permit was issued. It has a life of maybe 12 days left. On the 13th day, we'll revoke it on behalf of the customer just to make sure that none, none of that like slips through the cracks and any enforcement action we need to take. We, we have the, the evidence is not the right word, but the uh, documentation to move forward with items like that. So sticking on the topic of once a permit decision has been made, um, there are a variety of pathways and actions a shipment may need to go. So for non-compliant importers or customers attempting to or have already imported a dog into the United States unlawfully or suspected unlawfully, suspected non-compliances, uh, LDI is um, pretty proactive in trying to assist with that compliance and enforcement action. The first step to all of that is public outreach. So we have uh, documentation that we send to importers. This can be certified mail or email of um, alleged non-compliances. The first step before, I guess, the warning letter and then eventual enforcement actions is that public outreach step. Did you know that you are importing a dog for commercial purposes? Did you know there's a process? I went over it super briefly, but that process is lengthy and it's a little complicated if you're not a commercial entity trying to do this. So a big part of our job uh, within animal care and then specifically with my team on live dog import is that public outreach um, factor. Um, for instances where we reviewed the documents and gathered information, we feel an inspection may be warranted um, or we need some help kind of meeting the shipment on site. I'll reach out to our partners in animal welfare operations to see if we can coordinate an inspection, to see if we can get that inspection report, to see if we can get um, basically a veterinarian or an inspector to either verify what we suspect is happening or document what this importer is doing, because we don't usually hop to that right away. It's going to be repeated instances or like an importer who's importing an unusual amount. And, and I want to, I guess, caveat that and not say maybe unusual is the wrong word, but if you're going to be a, a mass importer, we want, we definitely want to make sure you're in compliance, right? So um, that is something that we reach out to um, our partners in animal welfare operations and the CDC as well to um, assist us when they can. I 
don't know if this point's on there, but as I mentioned earlier, um, input from the public or I wanna say the public sector, uh, either animal care facilities or people who have a stakeholders in the animal welfare um, realm, I guess, uh, contact us pretty regularly with concerns that they might have or just general questions. That's also a big part of our job that um, I wanna guess let the group know that it's something that we research pretty thoroughly and a, a big goal that I have for my team is that even if we cannot I guess, take an action because we don't have federal authority. A big part of um, the strides that we made in the past year is knowing who to reach out to across agency lines, even with state and local, to work together to see who has oversight and what can we do about some of these shipments. Personal pets are a big one, right? Um, Chad mentioned a million dogs. That's a lot of dogs, right? And he also mentioned 10,000 permits. 10,000 permits for, how many dogs was it? Sorry. So drop in a bucket compared to a million, right? So we're trying um, our hardest to make sure that all of these concerns are addressed. And a big part of, again, the team's efforts right now is just getting that outreach material out there. And we do have uh, a couple of enforcement cases pending for live dogs. So hopefully we'll see some um, results from that as we move forward in the upcoming fiscal year. All right, so uh, to wrap up kind of what we've talked about so far, this cycle I think is a really good example of kind of everything that I explained so far. So theoretically, when a dog shipment happens or gets referred to live dog import, it can fall anywhere on this circle, right? That's why it's <laughs> a circle. But uh, I'll start on the upper left, the orange. Um, that's kind of how it goes in the order of operations. So we do have an independent animal care process, right? You apply for a permit, we review it, um, we may contact the applicant's a, uh, attending veterinarian. We may contact veterinary services. So if it's an ASF country, there's post-entry requirements. There's a bathing schedule, right? So we will let them know, give them a heads up, work together on that. We may contact CDC if it's a high-risk rabies uh, origin dog. Uh, usually they're already on top of it. They know before us. So that's a great working relationship. So while we're reviewing that, if it gets issued, we move down to the lower left, the gray portion of the circle. Um, I kind of already mentioned that, but if it's issued, um, I guess I should clarify, in that orange section, we reach out to them if they're not aware, right? It's, it's for situational awareness. Once it's issued though, we do have to take certain coordination efforts, right? Um, I'm gonna keep using CDC as, a, as an example. We wanna make sure that it's going to the right port because if it's high risk rabies, there are limitations to where the dog can go and which animal care facilities are prepped to handle that, right? Um, so we will, we will reach out to CDC and confirm that all of that is true. And then I already used the bathing schedule uh, example for when it's issued. So moving on with that, now it's arriving at a port of entry. So it's coming in through a POE. Um, if there's a problem, we will try to collaborate with Animal, Ca uh, animal Care's AWO team, Animal Welfare Operations. Uh, CDC also has veterinary medical officers on staff. They've been a great help to me as I uh, try to do some of these things. So I reach out to them as well to see what information that they have. Um, in addition to that, I will add CBP as well because they are a law enforcement branch that is very useful when you're dealing with international import, right? It's customs and border protection. So for all intents and purposes, the dogs are still cargo. I think um, earlier today, we, we heard the term precious cargo. That is definitely true. Um, but as a couple slides later, I'm gonna talk about that baseline requirement is that it's still cargo, right? So we have to make sure that we're starting in the right steps because we're not siloed, but in that Venn diagram, we overlap. So the positive of that is collaboration, but when you overlap like that, you don't wanna overstep and kind of get in the way of certain things that other agencies have to take care of. And then moving up to theoretically the last step before the cycle repeats, the dogs are already in commerce. So at this point, technically live dog imports job is done, right? But this information is actually probably the most important step in I, I feel live dog imports uh, role, sorry, sorry, role within animal care right now. Um, if they notify us, they as in the public or our partner government agencies notify us that light suspected license activity is taking place that may violate the Animal Welfare Act. Uh, again, we reach out to the proper points of contact to see if we can take a proactive uh, approach to addressing some of these issues. All of that, again, is to build an enforcement case so that we can 
be better prepared when the cycle repeats itself. So this is a quick summary of, I guess, kind of the whole process right now. And it does touch on a lot of parts of animal care outside of live dog import. So after 11 slides of that, we're gonna talk about transportation. So, <laughs> so this is why we're here, right? Um, so after the permit is issued, how do the dogs get into the states? So I'm gonna talk about some of the ports of entry, some of the conveyances. So from the perspective of international import, live animal shipments, specifically dogs in our case, um, are gonna share the same base requirements from a logistics and customs point of view. Um, shipping options, timelines, ports of entry, international health status. So when I say that, basically, again, high-risk rabies, African swine fever, um, that's gonna affect the viability for import into the US, commercial versus non-commercial, right? Um, these are all things to take into consideration when we're talking about transportation. Um, I think it's been mentioned already, when, when we're talking about animals, live animals or biological vectors, right, in general, like it, it's going to be an elevated status of cargo. My opinion, just my sole opinion, the difficulty right now is that when you're dealing with multiple entities, that baseline is going to shift, right? All of us are in the animal welfare mission, I would say, I guess. So that, that baseline, we're gonna even subconsciously hold it to a higher standard. But we have to know that sometimes we're working within a baseline that is lawful and that the federal oversight matches. So the main pathways for dogs coming in is definitely by far, far and away is gonna be air, uh, commercial air usually. Um, we also see ground transport, um, not, not a lot, but I would say it's, it's second. So for example, this last month and the month before uh, for air, our highest ports are gonna be LAX in Los Angeles, JFK in New York, SeaTac, Seattle, SFO, San Francisco, and IAD in Washington, DC. Coming in on that list though, on the top 10, surprisingly are two land ports. So on the Southwest border, we're gonna have Otay Mesa. That one is east of San Diego on the Mexico, California border. And then in Arizona, we have Lukeville, Arizona, uh, which is two and a half hours south from Phoenix. Right, so both of those ports are in our top 10 for dogs being imported. So ground transport is actually uh, not a significant piece of the pie, but it's definitely a factor. Um, I will say right now, we also have dealt with in the past some land, trans some land transport from Canada. Um, so that's gonna be in the Northeast region, dogs usually going to the Northeast region of the States, coming in through uh, Buffalo, the Peace Bridge uh, port of entry in Buffalo. Um, maritime is super rare, right? So shipping a live animal by maritime, I think we all can kind of use common sense and see why that's a bad idea. Um, <laughs> it does happen though, um, those reports are non, you, they're all non-compliant. So it's usually um, right now what we're seeing is reports from our animal care inspectors and our patient. And then for whatever reason, they decide that I want to adopt the dog on vacation from the Bahamas or something, and then they get talked into it, or they get some bad information, and then they try to bring this dog in um, with sometimes no paperwork, questionable paperwork, but uh, those are non-compliant, and we address those as we go. Um, what's interesting, Chad and I had this conversation a, a couple of weeks back, is that um, the Animal Welfare Act and the transportation standards, as it's written, somebody could try to bring in a shipment of dogs on a ship. That would be a really bad idea. And this is why something that we, this is great that we're all talking about it to put it on our radar that if someone does try to do that, that is um, a concern. And that's something that we should address uh, proactively because I, we're not completely prepped for maritime, but you know, it's, it could be something that, you know, happens unexpectedly, right? There's nothing to base it on that. I just kind of like had that thought process that when I was looking up these numbers for air and, and land, well, theoretically, you know, somebody could try to bring it in by ship, which would be a bad idea. So most common, again, is commercial aircraft. And there's going to be, um, I'll talk about commercial aircraft first. So there's two types of that. There's going to be passenger planes. Um, so when you fly international, you're on the top, and then there's cargo on the bottom. So that's going to be a passenger commercial aircraft. 
And then there's gonna be cargo planes, freighters. So full on build outs that only hold cargo. So in our experience in live dog import, and this um, may not be true because honestly, the more money is involved, you can circumvent some of these things. But some of the imports that we see when they import dogs on a commercial basis, sometimes it's one dog, sometimes the shipment could have up to 40 dogs, right? So when you use a cargo plane and you're trying to work within your budget, let's say, most of the time cargo freighters are gonna make multiple stops, right? Just like a maritime freighter, it, it's not cost effective to send a boat from Germany to San Francisco. It's gonna make five stops along the way, right? So cargo freighters don't stop that quite often, but for example, we see a lot of dogs from Asia. That, that flight from Asia, depending on where it is, is gonna make at least two stops. So one for refueling at least from what we've seen, right? All of that, you have to take into consideration that there's cargo on board. So if it's cargo, that's fine. But if there's live dogs on board, there's transportation standards that that airline needs to abide by and make sure that the animal has well, you know, welfare checks and uh, food and water available. Um, we do also see um, private aircraft. So these are this is actually a real tra uh, registered transporter. We don't often see private aircraft do international flights in just because again, logistics, right? They just don't hold as much fuel. They can't really uh, fly in from that long of a distance. Uh, the couple of times we have seen it, again, it's gonna be from Canada. So Canada into uh, JFK usually. Um, Interesting enough, this transporter does also work within uh, California, but they do interstate commerce. Okay, so moving on to ground transport. So why would an importer choose land transport over air? So the most obvious for the United States, I guess for us is there's only two countries to do land transport from, right? That's gonna be Canada excuse me, Canada and Mexico. So we assume the reason why this would happen, uh, kind of reviewing the paperwork that we've seen historically, is it's a cost and logistics choice. So I'll use the, the Mexico res rescue groups as an example. The stated origin of the dogs is not gonna be close to let's say Mexico City. You, you need to fly out of a hub basically, right? To make sure that that makes sense from a business perspective. So these dogs um, that I'm gonna use in this example, in this slide and the next one, they are in Northern, Northeast Mexico. It makes the most sense to drive either through Arizona or through California. It doesn't make sense to go to back South to fly back out just from a cost perspective, right? And honestly, when there's land transport involved as well, all of that adds up. So the, the hours that the dogs are in the crate, that all adds up. So, so theoretically, if all goes right, the dog should actually be in transport less, a less amount of time by ground transport. We suspect some of the bad actors are not doing that because of animal welfare, right? They're doing that because of cost. So that, that's one of the reasons why um, you would choose land over air. That's kind of on the negative side, but I kind of you know, flip the coin and you know, hope for the best that they're doing it because it also speeds up the process. And in that process, the, hopefully the welfare of the animals is also addressed uh, appropriately. So the types of conveyances that we, or that not I normally see, but the inspectors or CBP would normally see are gonna be small trucks to vans. So you're not gonna see like the 18 wheelers and things like that. Those usually aren't built out uh, for dogs anyway. Um, you're gonna see these small vans. Um, they're temperature controlled. They have um, at least a build out where they can hold the crates securely. One thing I will say about um, land transport versus air transport is from Animal Care's live dog import team perspective, to verify a shipment and to enforce any non-compliances is much more difficult uh, when dealing with a land border. So I'll start with the very basic of when you're dealing with air shipments, the, the requirements are so much more strict, right? Ever since 9-11, for passengers and cargo, CBP is going to be much more strict on what you can transport. An airway bill, for example, goes so far in helping to even start that enforcement process. When you import something from another country into, when you import something internationally, you're going to need to abide by certain criteria from a customs point of view. So having an airway bill verifies that flight. That means we have an ETA, right? We all know how air travel is. It's not like the most accurate right now, 
but it's not like land crossing. Land crossing is if we approve the application and you say you're coming September 1st across Otay Mesa at 11 a.m., take that with the biggest grain of salt, right? Otay Mesa have it, has an average wait time of three hours across the border. And that's if you're not like, has have some sort of like expedited process. This is not every day. This is just kind of what we've seen. So if they say 11 o'clock, worst case scenario, there's an importer, it's a high risk uh, import for us. We suspect non-compliances. I reach out to animal welfare operations. I talk to our compliance assurance staff. We say, we wanna look at the shipment. We wanna see if we can get an inspection, confirm some of the things that we suspect. Can we coordinate? Animal care has been great to you know, work together and we try to do this, but we have to consider the resources, right? Like that inspector or inspectors are basically gonna to have to spend their whole day there. Um, I will touch into also another point about land border crossings is some of them are more remote. So Puff Buffalo Peace Bridge is a big port of entry in the Northeast, but Otay Mesa is a huge one too, actually. But Loopville um, is a very remote one, right? They have CBP station because it's an international port of entry, but you know, airports will have some of them, the major ones will have a CDC or public health office on site. Um, many of them have a USDA veterinary services office at least close by, right? Loopville unfortunately doesn't have that. They're kind of just out there. So I think the closest CDC quarantine station to the west is probably San Diego and east is El Paso. So think about the resources that you would need to coordinate, right? The reason why I love working with that port is the management at uh, Loopville, Arizona is so collaborative with us that they always give me a heads up that the shipment is coming in. And oftentimes I already have the permit application. I know who they're talking about. They're willing to flag the shipment. Um, if we can't get the information, their inspection report or inspection findings are super detailed. They send that to us. So I just use that as an example that not obviously, you know, not every port is going to be like that. And that's nothing to say about the agencies involved or the people involved. It's just that the resources, right? We, our closest animal care inspector to Loopville is gonna be in Phoenix. So that's two and a half hours one way. And she has gone down there to do an inspection before. This is gonna be some of the pictures from her uh, inspection three shipments ago. So that took her all day. And if you look at, I guess the first picture, there's a lot of dogs in there, right? So she, does, she did a super thorough job and it was great for us, I think as a learning experience and from a collaborative point of view, but what, what I will say about it for you all is this inspection came back clean, as in there were no non-compliances. I think you all will have an opinion about that, but think about, <laughs> think about this. So the transportation standards as they're written, right? Did, did, did the dogs have adequate space in the kennel? It's debatable from these pictures, but she's a great inspector. She did a super thorough job that the dog could stand up, turn around, lay down. It was clean, they had food and water. And this is something that we went over earlier, right? And this is, this is a challenge of why we're all together today. Those transportation standards, there's a baseline, right? When animal care is dealing with, let's say, uh, a lion or a bear or dolphins, those standards are exceeded. The threshold is there, but it's exceeded. And that's, that, that benchmark is what we're trying to hit. And that's our long-term goal, right? But we're also working towards like a happy medium of making sure that all animals are taken care of while in transport. So something that she, so that one looks bad, but this is actually after the fact. So those two on the top look unsecured. This was during the inspection process. The reason why I still chose this picture is the inspector was proactive with this importer, uh, with this transporter to let them know that, okay, this is technically compliant, but there's, there's an overcrowding concern here, right? Like if, we, if I needed to get to one of these dogs because they're ill, they're sick, I need to get to them immediately. I need to just visually make sure that all the dogs are okay quickly. She can't see that. These dogs had to be completely devanned, so basically unloaded in, the, in CBP secondary to do an exam. And because of the number of dogs, she needed to request CBP officers to actually help her. So again, that resource, it's, it's a courtesy, right? What if one of our inspectors is at a port of entry and they don't have that assistance? 
So the transporter has to play an active role in trying to proceed with animal welfare. So the reason why I still say this one is a success is because this was three shipments ago. The subsequent shipments from this transporter, CBP reported back to me that there was a noticeable improvement. So we don't have those pictures yet. She's, I'm not sure if she actually does, I should reach out to her, but uh, overcrowding was definitely not an issue uh, for the next one. And they were secured much better, right? So take it easy on me on the questions because I already knew where I was going with that. Um, yeah, I, I think from what we're seeing from an animal welfare point of view, it's uh, enforcement is honestly what I'm shooting for. It's what compliance assurance is shooting for. It's what animal care is shooting for to increase enforcement. Because within our agency and to, to the public stakeholders, enforcement is the reflection of work, right? But I wanted to just push across the message a little bit that a lot of our work in animal welfare is being proactive and, and making sure that the non-compliance does not occur, right? That's also a big part of our jobs. So this was a great example of collaboration. I think that it showed noticeable improvement, but unfortunately, and I'll see this sounds messed up. Unfortunately, we didn't cite them. So, you know, it, it's, it's a fine line to walk. Um, yeah. So I'll finish up with that. Um, that's our website right there for live dog import. All the information that I went over is on there, um, spelled out in a lot of detail. That's our general mailbox. So not just for questions. I know that in all your roles, you guys probably have seen some things. Hey, is that dog being transported correctly? Is this person a commercial entity, right? Claiming to be a private citizen. If you have those questions and concerns, feel free to email us. My team is more than happy to kind of assist with that. Uh, we, it's honestly very routine for us. So uh, feel free to reach out and I'll, I'll leave it to the questions. Thank okay, you. So just a reminder, if you have a question in person, please raise your hand. And if you have a question and you're attending virtually, please put it in the Q&A session. All right, first question. Thank you, uh, great presentation. Um, on the ground transportation, uh, international ground transportation, you saw California about seven years ago pass a ban on the retail sale of dogs and cats. And we saw anecdotally a huge explosion in the number of animals coming over from Mexico into California and an explosion in the black market sale of dogs. Washington and Oregon have recently passed that. We anticipate the same thing happening to a slightly lesser degree in British Columbia and Washington. Are you guys, number one, keeping data on that? And number two, planning to resource that? Because if your inspector is four or five hours away from the Washington, BC crossing point, uh, you are not gonna be able to get mm -hmm. those inspected. Yeah, so that's something that we keep an eye on because it's important. So let me give some background on that, right? What the key thing that you mentioned is there's a nexus to international imports. So that means it actually does fall into our responsibility, even though it's we're going to be notified of usual cases like that post entry. So correct me if I'm wrong, I'm going to flip the example and see if it applies. So a lot of what we see or get referred from the Otay Mesa port of entry is people will bring in dogs in a passenger car and kind of not kind of they declare to CBP that it's a personal pet, right? But come to find out, we'll also get reports that such and such dog, sometimes are even microchip, are being sold under the label of adoption with a fee. Adoption with a fee is, is selling a dog, right? So the, fir the first step before outreach or before any of that is we do the research. So if, if that were happening and we see that increase in other states coming from Canada, we first need to find that nexus to commercial importation and then set that information out to our inspectors in the area. If we don't have any in the area, we'll kind of put them on the radar that this may be happening. And then we need to coordinate with state and local about interest, interstate or intrastate commerce and are they following those uh, transportation requirements? Because if they violated the international import portion of it, we will follow up on outreach and enforcement. That's, that's our job in LDI. But once the dog is in the States, right, it, that, that has passed. It's, it's a violation that we'll address, but the commerce of it, the sale of it, um, and the movement, that's gonna be domestic and fall under the transportation requirements. So two separate parts of animal care would have to address two separate issues. Does, does that answer your question? 
I, I believe so. I, I think the, um, the, there was a news article recently, and I can't speak to its credibility, saying that there has been an explosion, something like over 100 different dog rescues now in the Tijuana area that all collect dogs to be shipped to the United States. So it, that's an awful lot of dogs to be moving by. Even, even if you've got mules moving them in passenger cars, that's a lot of dogs to be moving. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't want to, um, I guess, confirm or deny that without like seeing the source or citing it. What I will share with the group, though, is there's a reason why I, I kind of named off the ports on the, on the top 10 list that we keep an eye on, right? It is unusual for that amount of ground transport to hit our top 10 list when you're, you're competing against airplanes. So what you're talking about, it's not of the highest concern for live dog import right now because we, we airplane, right? Is just the quantity is still like the big thing, but it is harder. And I'm gonna speak in plain English here. It's harder to catch land border non-compliances because of the coordination involved. You're making a lawful de declaration when you enter the country. That means we're, we're already behind the eight ball, right? We have to go backwards. When it's air, we can at least get a heads up and be proactive. So what you're talking about, we all should be aware of that. And, and I would add to that, not to, you know, paranoia or anything, Northeast. Northeast and that Buffalo Peace Bridge um, crossing, same idea, right? People driving passenger cars saying that they're personal pets. If you're moving three dogs a week, like every month, you're probably not your dogs, right? So. Hi, um, my name's Rochelle Rogers. Um, I've asked a number of questions, but there was recently a dog incident of uh, some dogs that were picked up at the O'Hare airport and delivered, were being delivered to uh, a police station in Indiana. They were police dogs and they were in a box truck. Uh, the AC unit failed and the truck was in uh, traffic the dogs started barking, the guy pulled over. There was some dogs that were dead, some were dying. Um, they, they went to a humane animal facility, like an adoption facility or something. They tried to help the dogs. And then the dogs were put back on the truck, including the dead dogs. And they let the guy go back on the road to his destination and I failed to understand how that could happen. Yeah, I don't wanna fault, I guess, exactly local um, government entities that were involved in that. What I would say is being proactive in the outreach and the information plays a big role in this, right? Like did local PD or did, did they know to contact the Department of Agriculture? Because that's, that's a big role in our partners is the state and local. So every state is gonna have Department of Agriculture. They have a game warden, right? There should be a basically, I feel, I guess, um, part of that contingency plan, a local one, is that all the government entities kind of know, I guess from a general point of view, who their points of contact are. If you run across an animal welfare complaint for PD, I mean, I can only spe speak on, I guess, what I'm used to for local and federal, there is a, a point of contact, right? If you find a dead animal, that's gonna be, you know, yeah, red flag right away that you need to reach out to the right entities. I will, I guess, kind of gloss over the hard part and get to, that's a transportation standard that you can refer to animal care, right? We, we, we can open, um, I don't wanna speak for AWL, I, correct me if I'm wrong. We may do a search on this uh, entity to see if they're, well, registered for one if they're transporting animals or do they need to be licensed right so this is something that you can fast track to us if you hear about it because again we can look at it after the fact that, that, that there's no like limitation to it oh sorry yeah no you're doing great so when you hear that we can't be all eyes all ears everywhere so we really depend on the animal care uh complaint process so on that website in addition you can go online and do a complaint. You can get your inspector, or your local area supervisor, but you can always come through on the website and that goes right into our complaint log. And that would go because there'd still be, what it sounded like animals were still alive. We could, right. So as Alan said, whether they were needed to be registered, obviously, or were registered, that's something we could definitely pick up on our end. So I, that's my advice to everyone is due diligence, 
put it in there and we'll take it from there. Yeah, I think the problem is more if it ends up more than all transporters spaces. And it, it's a backlash on the good people, you know, that uh, something like that. Thank you. And just to follow up on the complaint uh, email address that was requested earlier, it's AC dot or a period complaints at USDA.gov. Again, that's AC dot complaints at USDA.gov. One last question. <laughs> Is there a, um, any data to access on enforcement that breaks down by transportation type and location? So if I understand the question correctly, as it relates to enforcement, I'm gonna have to circle back to answer that maybe on the panel later, but we do have, Animal Care has our public search tool that if there's an inspection report, nine compliances are on there, anybody? Yeah, so nine compliances are on there, I believe. Yes, that's correct. So. That is going to touch into enforcement, but any pending enforcement action, just like any government entity, definitely federal, if it's pending, it's not going to be for public dissemination until it's finalized. As far as the complaint process, it's just key to remember that once you submit your complaint, you may, if depending on the outcome of that complaint, you may or may not get a response. Most recently, we've gotten a lot of people that say, hey, I submitted a complaint and I never know the status of that complaint or what's happened with that complaint. Only valid complaints, basically we go through and we evaluate the complaints. We have a team that look at that. And as long as it's a violation of our regulation or a license, a license facility or entity, we would then send you a complaint search number, but you do have to FOIA the results of that complaint. So it's oftentimes a two-step process that most people forget and miss. You submit the complaint, but then you have to FOIA the results of the complaint if you receive a complaint number. Okay, Karen, do we have any additional questions virtually? Okay, next question. Um, so my question is, would your inspection or complaint process with this, because we talked about military pets earlier. Um, we have the air mobility command flights that come in and they do land, sometimes they land on base at McCord mm -hmm. Air Force Base, or yeah. they might land, sometimes they actually land at Seattle Tacoma International Airport. So if they're landing, even though it's a government flight, if they're landing at a public, I guess, uh, airport you'd say mm -hmm. and there are some issues with the transportation of those pets would that be under your purview or is that a military purview? yeah so it depends um i'll blanket that with saying that kind of service dogs were mentioned and don kind of gave us some uh insight on that already if it's a service dog as in it's police or military from an organization that's recognized by the u.s government there are exceptions to the things that i went over and possibly well, I'm actually, I'll say this, but correct me if I'm wrong, possibly even certain transportation standards, if it's a military or a working dog, um, because of some of the logistics, as you say. I doubt though, I haven't seen it in my time with animal care, but I doubt that let's say a dog from a high risk rabies country would be like a military dog, right? So that's something that pops in my head right away of like, well, that's not one of the approved ports you can land at, right? So for me in San Francisco, local, um, they would land at Travis Air Force Base, right? There is no one, there's no federal entity station there. That is an Air Force Base, right? So um, if there are animals coming in, they clearly have DOD exceptions, you know? Um, and if that makes it all the way to animal care, live dog import, that actually doesn't fall within the scope of commercial. And I'll route it up my chain of command to make sure those exceptions are addressed. All right, do we have any other questions for Alan? All right, well, thank you. Thank you all.